All right, we are live. Good evening. This is awesome. Light of Infinite Festival. So happy to be here. This is great. I don't know where you guys are tuning in from. Maybe some locals, East Coast, West Coast, Israel, all around the world. This is really, really so exciting. Thank you, Erez. What an amazing contribution. Right, We're a couple of days before Shavuos, before Shavuot. Everyone's trying to connect spiritually. Everyone's trying to find their jam, find their spiritual vibe right before Shavuos. And here we have this amazing festival, it's like 24 hours straight of amazing classes. I've been jumping in and out throughout the day and I've been loving it. And I'm so happy, so privileged to be here sharing with you a little bit of Torah as we get ready for the Holy Day. Okay, so my name is Rabbi Shlomo Buxbaum. I live in Maryland and uh, I'm going to share with you tonight the title of this talk is The Four Elements, A Guide to Discovering Your Inner World and Your Unique Purpose. And it's based on a recent book that I had the great privilege of putting out with that same title. Ooh, here it is in the camera. The Four Elements of an Empowered Life. When you think of the four elements, probably what comes to mind and what should come to mind is the idea that all of matter, this is, goes back to the ancients, the way the ancients viewed the world, they said that all matter can be broken down into fire or wind or air sometimes, but we'll call it now wind, fire, wind, water, and earth. And the way you might say it now, if you want to be a little bit more scientific about it, you might say that all of matter exists as either a solid, a liquid, gas, or pure energy, pure plasma. But we're going to work now with this ancient idea that everything, that all of matter is connected to these four elements, fire, wind, water, and earth. And in Kabbalah, we know that there is something called the Olam Gadol. There is the great, there's the, the world that we live in, the space that we live in, the world of three dimensions of time, of space. But there's also something called Olam Katan, a small world, an inner world, the world of our nefesh, our life force. And these two things are reflected. The world, the space that we live in, the external world, is a macrocosm. Our inner world, our life force, our nefesh, is a macrocosm. And those two worlds reflect each other. Hence, if all of matter is broken down into fire and wind and water and earth, and we can categorize things like that, that means that our inner world is also, we have realms inside of us that are compared to fire and wind and water and earth. And what we're going to do in this next half an hour or so is to try to unpack that and try to take a journey inward into our inner worlds and try to see how our life mission is very much centered around these four worlds. A note before we begin, and that is that we all have Kabbalah teaches, and this is something that's almost a universal idea. You know, even, even those who don't necessarily believe in any spiritual path, but even within the jargon of, of all civilizations, we believe, most people believe that, man, we are all put here with, a, with, a, with some sort of mission, and hopefully it's an individualized mission. It's something that is unique, specific to me. And we go through life looking, searching. We want to discover what is my mission? What is that unique thing that only I, Shlomo Buxbaum, whoever you are, wherever you are, what is that unique thing that is solely, that's all you, that you were put here, that no one before and no one afterwards, nobody can fulfill that. And of course, there are going to be moments in all of our life where we'll be called upon to do great things. And hopefully we'll be there right in the batter's box. We'll be ready when we're called upon to do great things. We're all going to have moments that might not seem that big at the time. But at that moment, we're going to do something. It's the right word. It's the right smile. It's just being there. And we're going to have those moments where the spotlight is going to be on us to do great things. But there's something much deeper when we speak about our life mission. And that is that every single moment that we are breathing, if we are alive, we're on a mission. And every single moment, every single moment of our life is full of that. Even the most mundane things, even when we don't feel like we're in the spotlight. 
The people that surround us, the loved ones, the people that are in our life, they're part of that mission. They're part of that mission. And, and every interaction that we have, who knows? Who knows? That could be an, another step forward in our mission. So when we speak about the four elements, what we're speaking about is really getting to know yourself, getting to know yourself at your high moments as well as at your low moments. Realizing throughout the day that we're constantly feeling within our inner world is constantly expressing itself in its earth element, in its water element, in its wind element, in its fire element. We fluctuate between all of those different realms. You know, I use a... a, a um, a, a, a mushal, a parable, a metaphor. And that is that if you imagine our, our, our inner world is like a ladder, you know, like we have in the Torah, Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, when he's, when he's there, when he's leaving Israel and he's going to the house of, he's, he's, he's going to, to, to Lavan to meet his wives, to do his years of, of, of gullus, of exile from Israel, and he has this dream. And the Torah says that he dreams of a ladder. And the foot of the ladder is on the ground, and the head of the ladder is in the heavens. And there are all these rungs on the ladder, and many of the Kabbalists understand that that ladder is a symbol of our nefesh. That ladder is a symbol of our inner world. And there are different rungs, and we go up those rungs, and we fall down on those rungs. And sometimes we're feeling low, and sometimes we're feeling high. Sometimes we're feeling expansive, and sometimes we're feeling constricted. But the, the nefesh, it has rungs, it has different levels. And the more that we learn about our inner world, the more we learn how to climb those levels and how to be in a place of high throughout the day. Or even when we're in a place of low, we understand what's happening. What's happening in our life? Why do we feel that way? And once we understand our inner world, we, are, we, we own it. Once we understand our inner world, then we have the tools to reach the ultimate level of self-mastery. And it's awesome and it's beautiful. Okay, so let's talk about this. And again, there are so many different Torah sources to understand where these four elements are. It's in, these, well, it goes way back to the Sefer Yitzira, the early books of Kabbalah, the Zohar. It's in the Medrash, the Talmud talks about it, the Rambam, Maimonides talks about it. But one who spends many pages discussing this is the Kabbalist of Tzfat, Rabbi Chaim Vital, in the Sefer Shari Kedusha. And he says that, all of our midot, all of our character traits are connected. They're either earth traits, they're water traits, they're wind traits, or they're fire traits. And he goes on and he explains each one. And what we're going to do for the next few minutes is expand on that. Show how that works. Show the model a little bit. And then after we do that, we're going to change channels and we're going to enter into the book of Bereshis, the book of Genesis. And we're going to show how those themes are actually the thread that unites, that binds, that tells the entire story of all that brings all the stories together within the book of Bereshis. So let's begin. You are familiar, you're certainly familiar, and you, you view yourself as different uh, facets, different components. You are a body, but you have an emotional realm. You have your thoughts, your mind, willpower, motivation. And one can imagine, one can imagine that all of these different realms that are inside of us can be compared to the four elements. So if we imagine our body, the most physical part of us, the most dense, it has the most mass, it weighs us down. Imagine our body or our most physical selves as being connected to the element of earth. Just like when the body of man was created on day six of creation, it says that Hashem took him off our minha adama, earth from the ground. So on the body, on the purely physical level, let's imagine that that is compared to earth. And we'll speak about what traits are, are born, are birthed from that shortly. But now let's climb to another rung of the ladder. And we know that we're not just physical bodies walking around. We're not just golems walking around the planet. But we have something that animates us, that makes life worth living, right? We don't only want to eat to stay alive. We want to eat to have pleasure. We don't only want to connect with other human beings so that they can give us what we need and we can barter our goods but we want to connect deeply with others. So on top of that, 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 that earthly body, that earth body is infused with an emotional realm. And let's think about that emotional realm as water. And if you can imagine the same way that emotions are sometimes rushing like water and sometimes they're calm like water. 
The same way water is gash is geshem is gashmiyut. It gives us it gives us the 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 chiyus, It gives us energy. It's the it's the fuel in our gas tank. Right, our emotions. Right, we we live and die by by the by the pleasure and the pain that we experience. And that's all compared to water. Okay, so we have the physical aspect of ourselves. That's the earth element. We have the emotional realm, and that is the water element. Okay, now we want to move up and on top of that, the next layer, the next rung on Jacob's ladder, the next floor in the elevator going up to the top is going to be the wind element. And that's going to be the realm of our thoughts, our intellectual realm. And in, in, in the same way that wind is constantly moving, right? We imagine our monkey mind. We imagine the constant train of thoughts that's always going in the same way, sometimes our thoughts can just be flying through our head. <laughs> I have a headache. I can't stop thinking, right? We know those moments too much. It's too many. Right? You think about it like a windy day, right? When you go outside and you, you have to hold on to, to your, your, your yarmulke because it's flying off because it's so windy, right? So that's, that's like our thoughts. But also, sometimes the wind is just calm. Sometimes it's quiet. We have the ability to slow down our thoughts. Wind is the element that creates movement in the world. It creates transition and transformation. And in our mind also, we're, we're, we're curious, we're creative, we're searching for more. It's our intellect that challenges us to gain new perspective in this world, to search, to find, to discover, to believe, to have goals. And that's the wind element. And then when we climb even a little bit higher, higher than our body, higher than our emotions, higher than our intellect, we get to some sort of somewhat transcendent realm. And people many times call it the spirit. I want to stay away from that because spirits sometimes can get confused with the soul, which is an even higher plane. That's what we call the nefesh elokis, the godly soul. But if we think about fire as being the highest point within our nefesh life force, and that is the realm of our will, of our motivation, our sense of wanting to be something, of wanting to make our mark in the world. Leadership, fire, motivation, passion, all of that comes from the element of fire. So again, if we want to break down this map of all of the human inner realms, we say we have the most physical realm, the realm of earth. We have the emotional realm, the realm of water. We have the element of wind, which is the intellect and our thoughts. And finally, we have fire, which is our willpower, our motivation. Okay, let's stop for a moment, take a deep breath, and try to interact with that. I'm looking on my screen, and just with the technology, I'm not sure if there are comments, if there are questions coming in. So I'm just going to keep on talking. It does look like there's a comment. I'm not sure how to see it, but you can find me. Um, afterwards, after the class, send me messages on the Facebook, on the Instagram, on wherever wherever you, you find human beings, I'm there. And I'd love to interact uh, afterwards. But in the meantime, I'm going to take a sip. You're, you're going to process what we just said. And I'm going to keep on talking. Rabbi Chaim Vital in Shari Kedusha says that there are negative, and we're going to start with negative, but we'll get to the positive. There are negative midot, there are negative expressions of, of our character that are born within the realm of each of these elements. From the element of earth, because earth is heavy, because earth has mass, it has weight and it's dense. So the heaviness that we feel as we go through our lives is born out of the element of earth. I hope as I'm speaking to you, I hope and I imagine anyone who's participating over here, I hope that you have joy in your life. I hope that you have a pleasant life. Uh, but no matter how beautiful of a life that you are living, I know for sure that there are moments of sadness that creep their way into your life because we all have it. It's a part of being a human being. We struggle with this from, from the, that very moment that Adam and Eve were evicted from the Garden of Eden and God said, It's going to be a rough ride. Everyone struggles with a certain amount of sadness and heaviness that they need to go through. A certain feeling in their life that says, I'm not good enough, I'm not big enough. 
why is everyone else, why does it seem like everyone else is moving past me in life? Why don't I feel happy? I, I, I thought by now I'd be farther along. I'm, 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 I'm not enough. And those are feelings that are born out of the element of earth. It's the heaviness of the element of earth. If we take a look at the very first story of humanity post Garden of Eden, that means right after Adam and Eve were evicted. And now the first human interaction that we have is between Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel. And we know that they both bring the sacrifice to God. And what happens? God takes Hevel's, Abel's, and does not take Cain's. And what happens? Cain gets depressed. And God says to Cain some of the most powerful words, and this is the major, the, the, the early stories of the Torah, as we're going to see, are so important and so absolutely powerful. And God says to Cain, He says, Lama charalach v'lama naflu panecha. Why are you so angry? Why do you look so depressed? Why are you so sad? And one can imagine how Cain feels, right? Here, he just brought a sacrifice to God. God took Hevel's and didn't take his. But yet, God says, Cain, move on. Don't get stuck. By the way, what's Cain's profession? The Torah says he's Oved Adama. He's a worker of the earth. Cain, the very first human being introduced to us after the sin of Adam and Eve, is an Oved Adama. He's from the earth element. He's connected to the element of earth. And what does God say? God says, Lama naflu panecha. Why? Don't, don't be so sad. Figure out how to deal with your emotions because if you allow yourself to get swept up into this black hole of darkness, of anger, of thinking that you're not good enough, la pesa chatas rovates, sin is going to crouch at your door. And Cain doesn't get the message. And he moves farther and farther into this depression. And then he goes ahead and he commits the unthinkable. He kills his brother. And in many ways, that's what the Torah's first introduction is. The Torah's teaching us about our inner world. The Cain that lives inside of us. The part of us that's always looking around and thinking, everybody else has it better than me. Lama naflu panecha. Try to work, try to get out of it, break free. And when Cain doesn't, what does God say? Orur Adama, God curses the earth that swallowed up Hevel's blood. And God tells Cain, Nav in Nad you're always going to be wandering the land. You're going to live with this anxiety every single time you open up Facebook, you're going to be scrolling through. Nav in Nad, you're going to be wandering on the earth thinking that everyone's better than you and everyone's pictures are so much so much prettier than yours and everyone's their the food that they're eating looks so much tastier on instagram and the, so do their vacations and so do their jobs and this one's thinner and this one's got more followers and this one's taking a vacation nothing not to but or it's we're wandering the land it's kind it's the earth element okay we move on and we're going to get back to some of the positives, so hang in there, and I, and, and, and I hope you'll, you'll stay with me. Reb Chaim Vital continues, and he says, what's the next one? It's water. And the water element we know is our emotional realm. In our emotional realm, we're looking for pleasure. We want pleasure. We want to make this ride beautiful. Don't give me bread and water. I want pizza and sushi and steak and burgers. I don't want shallow relationships. I want deep, meaningful relationships. And pleasure, we know. Pleasure is the most beautiful thing. We're here to enjoy the world. We're here to get so much pleasure. Our food's supposed to be delicious. Our relationships are supposed to be delicious. Everything, right? We're supposed to gain as much pleasure as we can as long as it's pleasure driven the right way. Lust can be the most dangerous emotion. Lust can be the most beautiful emotion when channeled properly. So we get to the water element and Rabbi Chaim Vital says that the danger of the water element is that when we're not learning how to properly channel our emotions or drive for pleasure, then ultimately if we're not being full, if our relationships are not robust, if our pleasure is not properly channeled, then we will gravitate towards forbidden lust, towards illicit pleasure. Let's go back to the book of Reishis. Remember, after the story of Cain and Abel, think back, what is the next major moment in the Torah? 
The next major story in the Torah is the generation of Noah and the flood. And the Torah introduces this generation by saying that, that the people of the land saw the Benosa arts, they took wives from whoever they wanted, they, they destroyed the world which, which the, the, the Medrash and Rashi brings, that they allowed their sexual immorality to just go crazy without any boundaries. And God says, I will destroy you, and how will I destroy you? With a flood of water. Cain, Cain, brought corruption to the earth element and the body level. The generation of the flood, through their sexual immorality and, and indulgence in forbidden lust, brought corruption to the emotional realm, the water element. And because of that, they were destroyed by water. And once again, we're going to get back to this and show the positive flip side of all of this. All right, so we're going to end on a happy note. All right, but the Torah doesn't begin on a happy note. The Torah begins on, on a low note. Okay. Let's move on now to the next, the next element. The next element is the element of wind. And we said the element of wind is connected to the intellect, to our thoughts. And in a sense, we are here to constantly be in search of the truth. We're all brilliant. We're all brilliant in our own way. And we have the ability to look at all of the knowledge and all the wisdom and all the creative passions in the world and once again sanctify it or we could corrupt it. I have this book that I'm reading. It's so beautiful. I don't remember what it's called, but it's like physics and God or something like that. And it goes through all of the all of the different scientific theories of the last you know two centuries or whatever. And it shows how beautiful they tie into Torah. Think about the wisdom of Kabbalah over the course of this festival. There's been so much so much Kabbalistic wisdom that's been shared. Think about the creativity that we've seen. Some of, some of these beautiful musicians. Right? The, uh, we have the ability to take all of the Chachma and channel it to something holy. But we know that all of that could be mischanneled as well, right? right? We know that it can lead to a person trying to deny God. It could confuse us. All of this wisdom can be used to be self-centered, to be self-serving. And now when we get to the third story of the Torah, after Cain and Abel connected to the earth element, after the generation of the flood connected to water, we get to the Tower of Babel. And we know that the Tower of Babel, the people that built this, they were brilliant architects. And they came up, they had this game plan, some sort of plan. The Torah doesn't tell us. We know that it's connected to speech, which is also connected to the element of wind, <laughs> according to Rabbi Chaim Vital. And somehow they bound together with unity to use their language to distance themselves from God. And God punishes them by changing their language. The Tower of Bavel is Babel. Right? Babel, like talking stupidity, talking silliness. And those who engage in silly discussion and, and trying to make mockery of important things that try to distort the truth that is a corruption of the wind element. And God corrupts their language. And then God scatters them like the wind. So now we have that third story, that third corrupt generation connected to the wind element. <coughs> and then finally, Rabbi Chaim Vital says that the fourth element that can be corrupted is the element of fire. And the purpose of fire, the purpose of our willpower, of our motivation is that we want to be great, but we want to, we want to make sure that we are authentically great. People do crazy things because they want their name to be remembered. Because they want to feel like they matter. And if we take a look at the fourth corrupt generation, we take a look at the world of Sodom. And Sodom, we know that they did horrible things, but if we look bottom line, what was the, the underlying, what was the underlying corruption of Sodom? The, 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 the Navi says that it was gaiva, it was arrogance. It was the sense, we know that Sodom was wealthy, they were rich, it was the richest place, it says it was like Gan Eden. It was literally, if you, if you imagine going into Sodom, one can only imagine, and I'm sure the landscaping was beautiful, I'm sure the homes, I'm sure they really had the nicest cars, maybe they didn't, but whatever they were driving, it was top of the line. And because of that, in Yiddish, we say they looked at themselves as besser a mention. I'm better than you. We don't take guests here. You can't be part of my club. You can't be part of my clique. The 
world of Sodom was a world that, that anyone that didn't live amongst them, that wasn't part of their clique, didn't matter. That's the world of Sodom. The world, the corruption of fire is when someone thinks I'm better because maybe I got more money, maybe I have a nicer car, maybe I have a nicer house, so therefore I am now better than you. You're not great. I'm great because of my standards. So that's Sodom. Sodom is the corruption of fire. So we see that these four early stories in the Torah, Cain kills Hevel, corruption of the earth element. The generation of the flood, corruption of the water element. The tower of Bavel, corruption of the wind element. And the generation of Sodom, corruption of the fire element. In our own life. In our own life, that manifests itself as the earth element, I'm feeling sad. The water element, I'm allowing my lust to take over. The wind element, I'm becoming distracted and allowing myself to become confused by the falsities that exist. The fire element, I'm allowing myself to think that I'm better than others because of my material success. And then, my friends, everything changes. Because now comes the world of Abraham and Sarah, of Isaac and Rebekah, of Jacob and his family, of Yosef and Yehuda. And those next four generations in the Torah, everything turns around. And now the Torah teaches us how to thrive. The world of Avraham, the world of Abraham, is the, the exact opposite of the world of Cain. Avraham it comes onto the scene and he's a man of expansion. He's a man of chesed. He's a man of joy, open tent. And everything in the world of Avraham is about expanding himself, expanding himself and showing that a person's true greatness is only when they can love other people. You know, Avraham Avinu wasn't the first person to believe in God. But he was the first person to welcome other people into his world and say, I don't just believe in God up there. I believe in God in there. I believe in God in you. That's why Avraham and Sarah, that's why they're the, the original patriarch and matriarch. So whereas Cain's world, where his world is, so, is, the, is the world of kinna, of jealousy, of smallness, of constriction. Right? I feel like everybody else is doing better and I, the only thing that I can do is go ahead and you know, shoot my brother because I can't take him anymore. The world of Avram is expansive and it's so full of, of love. And that's one of the reasons why you see that so many times in the world of Avram, he says things like, Anochi afar va'ifer, I'm just dust of the earth. Avram's final moment is a moment of burying Sarah, to which the, 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 the Torah says, Vayakam sede Ephron, the field of Ephron became elevated to which Rashi says that the actual earth itself, right? That's the grand finale of Avram. The earth itself became elevated because Avram knew how to live expansive, how to live with joy. Now, you know some people who they just walk in the room and the light is shining just when they walk in, just their energy, their presence, the smile on their face. That comes to battle, that comes to elevate the earth element. That comes to lift up themselves and the people around them. So Avram comes and he brings that, he fixes that world of Cain. Now comes along Yitzchak and Rivka, and we know that Yitzchak is the one that is Midas Gevura, he's the Midas Gevura of inner strength. And as it says in Pirkei Avos, Ezehu Gibor HaKovesh Es Yitzro. Who is the Gibor? Someone who knows how to channel all of their emotions the right way. And that's the world of Yitzchak. Yitzchak is definitely, he's not someone that tries to pull away from the world. We know that Yitzchak enjoys a good meal. It says that he loved his son because he brought him delicious food. And at the end of his life, he says, bring me food so I can give you a blessing. But even deeper, we know that who has the most romantic relationship, right? If, if, if one could say, and again, we're speaking about our patriarchs and matriarchs, so absolutely deep. But one thing that the Torah seems to clearly emphasize is how much Yitzchak loved Rivka. We see that more. We see a beauty. We see an intimacy in the relationship of Isaac and Rebekah more than any of the other couples. Because it's, 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 that, it's that Yitzchak, it's that Mida. That of, of, of gevura, that midah of strength, that midah of knowing how to, con of, of showing that self-control and discipline that says, I know how to properly channel my emotions. I don't have to shut anything down. 
I don't have to turn off the lust. I don't have to turn off the desire. I just need to realize that it's a gift to use for something beautiful, to be channeled for something beautiful. And of course, so much of Yitzhak's life, he's, if you ever think about where do we find Yitzhak the most? He's always at wells. Right? Go back to the Torah. He's digging wells here, he's digging wells there. Why? Because the Torah is telling us that Yitzhak elevates the element of water. And then we get to Yaakov. Yaakov is Ish Emes, the man of truth. The man who struggled so much with so many ethical dilemmas and somehow or another the Torah always takes us in to Yaakov as being really the most nuanced, all of the different dilemmas that he's faced with. Having to learn street smarts even though he's Yaakov Ish Ohalim, Yaakov a man of tents. And in this moment, this, this, that moment that we spoke about earlier where he dreams of this ladder, the Torah uses almost identical language to a much earlier story in the Torah, the Tower of Babel, which was the corruption of the wind element. And here, that very same tower that they tried to build with its feet on the earth and its sky in the heaven, its top in the heaven and the sky, Jacob also now dreams of this ladder with its feet on the earth and its head in the sky. Both the Tower of Babel and Yaakov, they both have their head in the clouds. Except for the Tower of Bavel, it's false. Falsities, it's Sheker. And in the world of Yaakov, it's the world of Emes. It's the world of truth. It's the world of clarifying your convictions. Yaakov's name is changed to Yisrael, which are the same letters as Roshli, my head is mine. You can't tell me how to think. Not the media, not, 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 not group think. Nobody. Roshli, my head is mine. We got to finish up with the very last step is now we meet Yosef and Yehuda, the two amazing dynasties that are going to be born, the two kings and how they have to work out all of their stuff before finally they can crown, they could accept Yosef as a leader and Yehuda as a leader. And later on in history, all of the kings are going to come from Joseph and Yehuda. And one thing that we can say about both of them is they are humble and they are fearless. They are great. They show amazing leadership. Yehuda in his way, Joseph in his way. They're both tremendous kings and leaders. But Yehuda, the very name Yehuda, comes from Hod. Hod is empathy. Hod is humility. Yosef, at his highest moments, when he's being crowned, he never takes any of the credit. He always says, Yireli Kim. I fear God. It's all from God. Yosef and Yehuda are true fire because they are the humble and the fearless leader. And that counteracts the world of Sodom. So everything in the world of Veracious revolves around these four elements, showing that in our own life, these are our struggles. As we go, sometimes we're feeling down like the earth, sometimes we're feeling lustful like water, sometimes we're feeling confused like wind, sometimes we're feeling haughty and arrogant like fire, but, but our whole journey in this lifetime is to be able to smooth out those hard edges, to be able to elevate all of the inner elements and become the greatest possible people that we can be. And here we are coming up to the holiday of Shavuot. We have the splitting of the sea, the water element behind us. We have the flaming mountain of fire right in front of us. And God is calling upon every single one of us to realize that we have greatness inside of us. Greatness, greatness inside of us. And in order to accomplish our mission, we don't want to look outward, not yet. We always want to make sure we're looking inward. And the more we reach that inner self-mastery, the more that will attract all of the goodness and all of the awesomeness to us. Because every single person is put on this world with a mission. We're all incredible. We're all amazing. But we all have to really get to know ourselves to really understand how amazing we are. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. I hope that we'll be able to continue this conversation afterwards. Thank you, Erez. Thank you, Light of Infinite Festival. May we all merit to stand at Sinai once again in the festival of Shavuot that's coming up. And every single person out there should accept the Torah in their own unique way. Have a good night.